right, well, welcome everybody uh, to the 2022 uh, Business Education Series. Uh, this is hosted by AMA Phoenix Chapter, and we are excited to have you here. And uh, my name is Chris Pace. I'm the president of uh, the board for AMA Phoenix Chapter, and it's a pleasure seeing all of you. And uh, on that note, I would like to introduce our vice president of programming, Anna Bryce, who's going to kick us off. Great. Thank you very much, Chris, and welcome, everybody. We are thrilled to have you here with us this afternoon, and we are even more thrilled to welcome our speaker, Matt Cates from Prize Logic, uh, to be here with us. He's going to be talking about how to gamify your user-generated content marketing strategies, and we are very excited to uh, talk about this topic because we really haven't had it here um, in our AMA webinars. So this is a good timing to start it off with Matt. And I just want to real quick do a couple of um, housekeeping items. First, I would like to thank our sponsors. We have a great group of sponsors who make all this possible. Uh, we do a lot of work to bring these programs to you, and a lot of this is because of our work with our sponsors. And I would like to point out Taylor Wellman, who is our host and is always our host for these webinars uh, from Financial Potion. If you have video needs, I would encourage you to give Taylor a call. And also, if you uh, need her contact information, I'd be more than happy to connect you. And also would like to thank our board members. There's a lot of work that goes into uh, the AMA Phoenix and we don't really see it, it just happens and it's because of our wonderful board members. We have such a great group of people. Uh, we just cannot say enough for all the work that they do, so thank you. And then last, I wanna mention the Spectrum Awards, um, thanks Taylor. That, sorry, I think I threw that in uh, unexpectedly. No but problem. we have a little more than a week left for submissions for the Spectrum Awards. And with us on this telecast, we have one of our Spectrum Award winners, which is Lisa, and uh, that's from Shasta Pools. So please everybody, uh, get your, your submissions in April 15th. We all know the date of April 15th for another reason, uh, but it is also spectrum submission deadline. So uh, please put that in your calendar and get your submissions in. And now I would just like to get straight into introducing our speaker, Matt Cates from Prize Logic. We are thrilled to have him with us all the way from a cold place from Michigan. And uh, so we really appreciate Matt taking the time with us. Matt specializes in developing innovative solutions that bring creativity, technology, and marketing all together to achieve measurable results. He has 20 plus years of experience in marketing, ranging from promotions and loyalty marketing and brand management for many brands that we've heard of, in, including these brands and much, much more, but PepsiCo, Kellogg's, Molson, Coors, T-Mobile, Coca-Cola, and Microsoft. So without any further delay, I would like to introduce Matt. Matt, welcome and thank you again for being with us. We really appreciate your time. Excellent, thank you so much, Anna. Um, thank you, Taylor, for uh, making sure everything looks good. Um, excited to join everyone today and uh, discuss what what is a topic that I really enjoy um, for a few reasons. It's fun, it's creative, um, and on top of that, it uh, it actually delivers real results to brand. So yeah, today's topic is user generated content, um, specifically you know how do we gamify it? Um, we want to keep it authentic. That's really key to a successful strategy. But how do we stimulate more conversation, more engagement, um, as well as more of the, more like guiding the conversation, um, helping kind of steward it in directions that for our brand would like 
from just topics to achieve certain strategies that they're focused on. Uh, right, so it, um, very quickly, so we work for a company called Prize Logic. Um, we focus in what we call incentivize engagement, promotions, rebates, loyalty, and we use it to basically capture attention and, and motivate consumer behavior. We have the great privilege of working with many leading agencies, um, as well as directly with brands. It's, it's a fun job. We get to use the right side of the brain, the left side of the brain, create really cool stuff um, and, and have fun along the way. As I was preparing this presentation, it dawned on me that you know, around 20 years ago, I gave my first uh, UVC presentation at Navy Pier uh, in Chicago. Um, and, and 20 years is, is a long time. Um, it's, it's frightening for me, but it, you know, also as I think about like 20 years is a, is a real long time when we think about digital marketing and, and technology. And so like looking back 20 years, like what was cool then is, is really obsolete now, you know? Um, it was right around this time that I was so excited to get my first Blackberry, which is game changing. You know, no longer did I need to carry around my Palm Pilot. You know, even better, I was able to send and receive emails from my phone and, and hit a keyboard, which is like amazing. Um, but, you know, we also had, you know, uh, I don't know if anyone recognize this or do you use it anymore, um, but you, know, you were able to, for around $1,000, have this beautiful uh, toy here. It was cutting edge of the time. Um, that was about a two and a half inch screen that pops out, but for a thousand dollars, you have to insert a tape physically to it. Um, very much obsolete. Um, and truly I was proud when I got my Hotmail account, um, picked my name and everything. Um, Hotmail was by far the biggest email platform back then, over a hundred million people using it. Um, Gmail hadn't even been close to coming out yet. Um, Hotmail dominated the competition, AOL. All these things 20 years ago, cutting edge. And if I used any of these things, you would laugh at me for it. Um, so to me, what's really amazing is 20 years later, UGC is, is more popular than ever before. Um, so while all of the devices that I used back then um, are laughable and, and obsolete, the topic um, is alive, it's well, it's more powerful, um, and it, it continues to grow in so many different ways. So in terms of an agenda, um, we're just gonna really quickly give a quick definition of user-generated content. I'm sure most people know what that is, but um, just in case someone doesn't, um, really fast on that, and hey, it's always nice to be the smartest person in the room. Um, from there, um, talk about like why it's so popular today, why it continues to grow in popularity um, from consumers as, as well as for brands, um, and then gamifying UGC marketing. First, like what does he mean by that? Um, and then what are some best practices so we can ensure we're doing it right, get the most value out of it, um, protect ourselves from potential missteps. Um, you know, from there, looking at a few different uh, case studies that I pulled, um, the majority, I would say in full transparency in case I forget later, pretty much every single one we participated in directly uh, with a brand or a partner agency except the Sephora one. So if I forget to say that later, if I may, I don't want to imply credit where there isn't, but uh, there's lots of fun ones in there. Um, and so show enough for uh, examples, not just because they're fun um, and they're different, but they can be used to achieve a variety of different marketing objectives. Then offer you know, one final takeaway, and before you get completely bored of me, we'll hit Q&A um, and go from there. So very quickly, what is UGC? Basically three parts of it. It's basically any form of content. That could be text, photos, drawings, video, um, audio. We've done one where we had people do their best Chewbacca imitation. So any of those things, any form of content, it's voluntarily uh, created by individual people. So we're not paying them to do it. They don't work for a brand. They don't work for an agency. We may motivate them to do it, but it's purely their choice. Um, and then they create it and they share it, typically online. Um, there are some purists who believe that all user-generated content is online, um, but you could make an argument as well that there are some offline places as well. But online blog posts, social media, uh, brand pages, podcasts, review sites, but basically they're creating this genuine, organic content um, about uh, sometimes about the brand, sometimes not, but obviously our, our clients are most interested in the brand portion of it. 
So why is it so popular today? You know, if you think about UBC, there's two things um, and two things that make it effective and two things that, that made it incredibly popular. It's about content creation and then content distribution. So, you know, if we go back 20 years ago and talk about all that uh, fancy technology, um, you know, the, the as amazing as the Blackberry was, and it was amazing then, it had zero ability to take pictures, you know, let alone videos. You can kind of access the web, but you know, it was slow and I couldn't put anything on there. Um, but if you wanted to, you know, create videos, it's great. You've got your you know, $1,000 uh, Sony uh, camcorder. Um, challenges, most people didn't have it. Um, those that did, didn't carry it around everywhere with them. Um, if you created that content, I can't even remember if or how you could take it from the cassette that's in it and somehow put it on your computer and online. It just, you know, so we could capture it um, as raw as it was, but there was kind of limited use outside of your house um, for viewing it. Um, Hotmail, as they said, was there, but really no major, you know, some of the early social networks, but, you know, MySpace was probably a couple of years off. Uh, Facebook as well, but they just hadn't started. Um, you know, so in terms of my ability to share that content, um, you know, the most I could do was email it, which which is a form and it, and it works, um, but certainly not to the great reach. And I've got to type people's names in one at a time. And you know, very effective back then. It, uh, everyone was forwarding terrible jokes indiscriminately, but in terms of like user generated content, it wasn't there. So, you know. That's why things are so much, you know, bigger and better today. It's all about content creation and content distribution. Um, and so things are very different. Um, we don't have Blackberries anymore. Most of us don't. We have smartphones. Um, and smartphones are amazing for many different reasons. Um, first, you have them 24-7. Um, so if there's a moment or a need to capture something, it's right there. Um, not only can you capture it, you can you know, take great pictures and then you can enhance them in many different ways, um, improving the quality dramatically. Um, and videos, you know, the capability is crazy. You have aspiring directors literally creating feature length films on it um, through the tool. So you have the ability to capture, create content in the palm of your hand 24 seven that exceeds anything that was there before. Um, and through a few clicks, you can immediately, you know, distribute it on your favorite social platform. No finding the black cord that goes to your camcorder. It's, it's all there right away. Um, posting, you know, really high quality, great polished content. Um, obviously, lots of social networks. So there's tremendous growth um, in platforms and types and places as well as people's participation in them. So now instead of trying to make an attachment an email and send it to a couple of people, I can put it up uh, and have access to hundreds of thousands of people immediately. On top of that, social networks, uh, particularly ones like TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, they're great at helping you create your, your content. So I can create it, I can publish it, um, many other ways to do it. And then even beyond that, you know, brands work with us and, and other agencies to create proprietary capabilities to develop their own unique ways of writing content. So many, many different ways to develop content um, that is of high value and distribute it broadly in moments notice. Um, so why is UGC so popular today? It really breaking a few pieces, it, accessibility. Um, I have it at my fingertips, the ability to create it. Um, and distribute it at, at any moment. Um, equally important is quality. Like brands have their own image, their own standards to maintain. Um, the ability to produce higher quality content um, is looked upon, you know, much more favorably by brands, but also, you know, consumers, I like to look at better quality content too. Um, so it's accessible, it's higher quality, and then you've got potentially massive reach um, immediately at your fingertips. And, those three things combined for the ability to do some pretty impactful things um, with user-generated content. Um, by impactful, like putting on you know, my, my strategy hat, my, my marketing hat for, for the brands that we work with, look at just kind of a, a very simple path to purchase um, content engagement, you know, product discovery, 
trust the content? Does it influence purchase? And let's look at this through the lens of user-generated content. Um, so from a content engagement standpoint, um, by the way, Google any of the any user-generated content stats and you'll find 20 different versions of the stats. So they're well out there. I just picked ones that I found as entertaining um, uh, or to tie to my themes, but they're everywhere. And they date back, you know, 10, 15 years, but very consistent, very similar. The people aren't getting tired from an impact standpoint. So from a content engagement standpoint, 41% of US consumers spend more time watching user-generated content video online than they do watching television shows and movies and uh, streaming video services. So we think of the explosion of streaming services out there with Netflix and Hulu and Apple Plus and HBO Max and all the ones that I'm paying for. Um, that 41% of consumers spend more time watching user-generated content. Um, and that's not even including looking at pictures and swiping and all those things, just from a content standpoint. And Marketing 101, you want to be where consumers are. If they're there, we want to be there. So they're engaging in content, they're looking at content. Is there any marketing value to it? Uh, in this IPSO survey, a one in two people surveyed to use Instagram to discover new brands, products, or services. So I'm seeing this stuff, I'm not ignoring it, it piques my curiosity. Um, I discover it. Um, classic kind of path down, path to purchase. Um, most importantly, and very interestingly, they trust it. Um, they trust their friends. They're, they're even uh, highly polished, highly credible brands out there. People want to know from their friends, their networks, their friends' friends, um, is what do you think? I'm not going to buy anything if I don't know his your review or get an opinion. Um, it's not just consumers who acknowledge this. 93% of marketers also agree that consumers trust content created by customers more than the content created by brands. So it's a shared space, it's a shared sale, um, and consumers play a major role in it. So the ability for brands to uh, participate in that conversation, um, they can't force people to, do, to, to post certain content or say certain things, um, that wouldn't work, um, but they can certainly do things to help influence what's said, how it's said, um, amplifying the positivity um, around it. And you take those three things and does it influence purchase? Yeah, 79% um, of people say UGC highly impacts their purchasing decisions while only 12% say branded content. Um, and it's just amazing the, the, the difference in that. And if you think about all the content that's created, the majority of it out there is created by consumers. So that space is owned by consumers. Um, so what can brands do to help participate in it, help nudge it a little one way, getting their message out? Because that's where people are. That's where people are listening. That's why UGC is amazing to consumers um, as well as to brands. So gamifying UGC um, marketing, like what, are, what do I mean by that? If I do it, you know, what are some best practices around it? So let's start off by saying like gamification is used in so many different ways. Um, what, what do you mean when you say it in this particular one situation? So think of like the pyramid I'm showing is sometimes we'll call it's like a, a classic advocacy pyramid. Um, when you think of your consumers, um, at the bottom, you have brand adopters. These are people who they buy your product, you know, they use your product, but it's a little bit more of a you know, transactional relationship, neither bad nor good. I, I buy it regularly, but there's, you know, no deeper emotional connection. That's okay. They spend their money. It's great. The next level up is brand adorers. This is like the really interesting one. They're people, they love your brand. Um, they're not advocates. And it's not like they're being coy or, you know, holding back or they're shy. Um, you know, people are busy. People are lazy. Um, people have a finite amount of time. And when you're competing for their time, you're not just competing against your competitor cereal brand or beer brand. You're competing against every brand out there as well as the, you know, the, their discretionary time for entertainment and stuff. Um, you're competing for a share of time even before you get to share a wallet. And so people may love your brand. Um, some of them may even have the best intentions of being an advocate. Um, but then they get busy, they get distracted, and but again, they'll continue to buy it. They're wonderful for your brand. 
one level up are the people we love, brand advocates. Um, these are the ones who are helping that whole little journey we talked about, getting people, you know, creating good content that people engage with it. It's persuasive. They discover things. They, they trust it, and then they buy off of it. It's golden space. And so in that pyramid, a marketer's goal is to provide a stimuli that drives organic behavior. We want it to be organic because that's that's what makes it special. That's what makes it real. If it's not organic, it, it can have an opposite effect to it. Um, and the goal that stimulates to do two things. We want to boost the proportion of advocates. So take some of those brandadors um, and give them a reason, a thought, of, you know, to say, you know, I love it. And here's a moment where I do want to share why I love it. Um, but we got to stimulate that because not going to just naturally happen, no matter how much we love your brand. But then on top of it, don't take your uh, existing advocates uh, for granted. We want to amplify what they're doing, amplify it in two ways. One, um, they like talking about us. I want to give them new, other, different reasons to talk about us. I want to tell them things that I'd like to hear them say and hope they agree and hope they say it, um, as well as I want to help them share it more broadly if possible, too. Um, and I'd like if, you know, if everyone's good with it, I'd like, I wouldn't mind using that content um, in my own way um, to, you know, add value to it. It's authentic. I'd like to take advantage of it and promote it as well. So simple as that. We want to provide a stimuli, get some of those brand adorers, become brand advocates, get those brand advocates who talk about us already, talk about us more, talk about us a little louder. That's what it's about. So still, why gamify? So you can certainly do this by, you know, asking like a, throwing out a topic of stimuli. What, you know, what do you think of, you know, the, the, the new Dodge that's coming out? What's your favorite feature? You know, what did you cook last night for Thanksgiving? Whatever it may be, how are you treating, you know, treating your grass? Brands can ask questions that are relevant to get conversation going um, and people will talk. And so I'm not against um, throwing out topics to, to stimulate you know, conversation. You should do it. Um, you, but like anything, you should mix up your game a little bit um, because I'm only going to comment a certain amount of times. And as I said, I'm, I'm busy and we're kind of in this economy of choice right now. Consumers are empowered to engage as well as not engage. Um, there's also a concept of value exchange. You know, if you want to motivate me a little bit more, I'll give you value. You give me value um, as long as it's still what I think. So you're not forcing me to say something contrary because that's I don't like that and it's not good for you either. So again, definitely do topics every now and then. You shouldn't be throwing incentives left and right. It's about your, your mix of what you're doing. But if you take those topics, if you take those questions, those challenges, what's your, what's your favorite trip with Hilton? Um, what's your favorite recipe? Show us your new look. Show us your beauty maker, whatever it might be. But then you add an incentive to it. And that incentive is kind of the gamification piece to it is it could be uh, sweepstakes, which is basically like saying, just share it and you know, give you a chance at winning this great prize. Um, it can be as easy as sharing a picture. It could be something bigger than that. Um, so basically you share it, um, do a hashtag or what have you. Um, sometimes you just submit it to the website. Um, and then I, as long as you follow the rules, which we'll get into later, um, you have a chance at winning. Um, contests can be a little bit more fun for a few reasons. One. It feels like um, people are a little more empowered. Um, I can create good content. I, I have a little more control of the situation to win. Um, it also helps, you know, sometimes motivates people to put a little bit more time and effort into the content that they create um, because they feel that you know, they're empowered. The better it is, the better my chances. Um, and so I'm incentivizing people to do it. I'm giving the, the theme, the direction I'd like to go. I, I, at the end of the day, I can't control what they say, but if I know my brand and, um, and I'm, you know, being authentic with my brand with my consumers, um, I give them a topic that's interesting, I give them a little incentive, um, and, and then we get things going. And, and what's great about, you know, a sweepstakes entry or a contest is the value of people sharing in social media, you know, outside of Kim Kardashian's world, but like, you know, me and my few hundred friends or what have you, is it's the it's the rolled up macro value of lots of maths doing it. Um, if you were to truly, if a brand were to truly come to me, they'd say, here's seven cents if you do this. And I would feel insulted. 
they can't pay more than that because that wouldn't be valuable. Um, but if you give something that is of aspirational bigger value, and lots of people do it, then it becomes cost efficient. Um, and it also becomes exciting. I'm not excited by seven cents. I might be excited by a trip, a new car, a beauty makeover, you name it. So that's what I mean when I talk about gamifying the experience, making it essentially a game, a contest. A, a, and we'll show different examples of, of, to bring that to life. Um, but at the risk of killing everyone's enthusiasm, um, let's talk legal as best practice. And I know legal feels like it takes the fun out of marketing. And as long as my lawyer counterparts aren't here, I would agree. Um, they create obstacles and hurdles and they take away the fun. Um, However, when it comes to UGC, legal is, is your best friend, without question. Uh, program rules protect you in so many different ways. Um, so just quickly, like, yeah, there are legal technicalities, and, you know, how privacy policies and certain laws and regulations. But, but beyond that, use legal to ensure the right type of content is produced, like, and people are motivated to produce the right content because I, I want to try and win something. It doesn't mean that some people will be nefarious. They're going to do that no matter what, but getting more people to do the good stuff means the nefarious ones are, are kind of drowned out a little bit. So, you know, I, I want it to be in English. I, video is no longer than 30 seconds. Like you're kind of defining what, what's the type of content I want to produce. At the end of the day, that's what I want. I also don't want you to disparage, you know, my brand. Um, I don't want you to promote another cause in it because that muddies the water and undermines it. Um, I don't want PR nightmares with, you know, hateful, defamatory, and, you know, racial tones like that. I, I don't want this thing to blow up in my face and become a PR nightmare, you know. And then lastly, I do those things and you produce this great content. I want to make sure I'm able to use it. Um, and so there are things that you need to think about that you might not think about. Meaning like if someone randomly walks behind you as you're shooting something, I can't use it because that person sees me marketing that, I love it, but they, they didn't give me the rights to it. And so in this taco, uh, it was a great Taco Bell, loving tacos, get married in Vegas, um, fun, a little edgy, definitely want rules to make it not go too far. Um, but I want to be able to use it again. And, you know, or, or if you inadvertently use someone else's um, copyrighted material, a song or something like that, or trademark, it would be terrible if you did this great stuff and I loved it and then I realized I can't use it. So legal is definitely your friend, um, at least in this situation. So two, make it clear what you want. Um, sometimes we're so quick and, you know, and someone might say, like the example I like to use is, Everyone close their eyes and I'm going to say, picture a dog. We will all picture a dog, but the dog we picture is a little different. Mine might be short, yours might be tall, long hair, short hair, old, young, puppy. Um, so giving people simple direction um, is very helpful to them because they want to get it right. Very helpful to you because you want them to get it right. Um, and so, yeah, it's all outlined in the rules, but people aren't scrolling down and clicking on that and reading the language. Um, rules are there as as a safety net to protect yourself, to ensure that you're picking ultimately the winner that, you know, that meets the, the criteria versus something going sideways on you. Um, and so very important to do and I'll see if we were debating, is this worth trying or not? But basically this is a program um, by Dodge. Um, it's really nice. It's basically, they wanted to have uh, an advocate instead of going to an agency where they identify, uh, um, someone who they think you know has followers and that they, they opened it up to the public and said, hey, we're going to make you the Dodge Chief Donut Maker. Um, and all you got to do, and, and it's fun the way they designed this too, is they're basically saying like, you know, this is the hiring process. They're accepting applications. The, vid the video submissions are positioned as interviews. Um, and then through this, they give um, uh, Bob Goldberg, who's very engaging, you know, tell us who you are. They want, they're, they want to help you do it well because you doing it well is good for us too. You know, show us you want it. Show us that passion. Make it creative. I'll give you some tips on it. Like nail the, the technicality. So, you know, 
basically those rules that are everyone has the chance to become chief donut maker but your video must meet some basic requirements your voice should be loud and clear with no background noise avoid using unlicensed music basically if you didn't make it you can't use it make sure you're well lit the better we can see you the better we can see you as chief donut maker make your video safely and legally last but not least you can only submit one video do you have what it takes? So, you know, this is, I would call it a, uh, a higher cost sort of one um, to do, but there are other ways to just, you know, throw up a gallery, which many of them do, and show other examples, feature the ones that show directionally what the, what the output you want looks like. It also, they also inspire people to do it, give very clear directions, um, you know, help them do it right. And, and everyone wins. So from there, don't completely give up control. Um, that doesn't mean like, you know, get in the way of it being organic and authentic, but the worst thing you ever could do in the social media world is give up control. It's, a, it's littered with terrible outcomes where a brand didn't have the ability to either approve the ultimate winner or pick the ultimate winner, and then they get to give this person this huge check for doing something so terrible, um, and it's bad for everyone. So, you know, example that we were talking about earlier, um, Taco Bell's Love and Tacos, um, certainly people can put some risque stuff out there who are a couple wanting to get married in Vegas. Um, so we kind of break it into parts. Um, we invite people to vote. It's a great thing to do because not everyone submits content. Um, so there are people who will submit content and a, a large number who will vote on it. Um, and it gets other people engaged right away. It also, if I'm submitting content, it motivates me to tell my friends and family because if they're my friends and family, I, I really hope they vote for me over the competitors. So they're helping amplify it. Um, so invite people to vote. Voting can help, uh, different ways you do it is you they, the votes can determine the top 10, um, but judges based on specific criteria determine the winner. Sometimes uh, the judging criteria is 30% of the vote, and but then the judges, you know, based on other criteria control the other 70%. So it's great, invite them in. And if you're asking them to vote, make them feel like it does matter, and it does. It, it helps the ones rise to the top, but it doesn't kill you in the end too. Um, it next, it has to be credible. Um, it needs to fit your brand to be authentic. And if it's not, the social media police out there will kill you for it. And so this is just a great program um, by Dixie. Uh, we're talking about the beginning of the pandemic. Um, brands don't want to go totally dark and silent, but it's kind of an awkward time to reach out. And I don't want to reach out and pretend nothing's going on because that would be kind of weird, but also don't want to like, be perceived as taking advantage of this, you know, terrible situation because we all know that could backfire. So, how could Dixie be relevant, be friendly, um, contribute in in a way that's fair and show some, um, you know, connection, understanding of their consumers? And it's very simple. It's, Dixie says, "See, you've got a lot in your plate." Contest, um, and basically, our goal is to make your life. A little bit more manageable. Um, and so uh, what Dixie asked people to do is they'll snap a picture or a video, make it simple, um, and tell me like what what we as a brand can do to help, what we can take off your plate that's harder now than it was before. So submit that picture or video with a description. And then again, they want to help you and they also kind of want to stimulate, you know, they have an idea of what type of content will play well. So they'll Give you some ideas if you're you know like so they'll they say like dixie asks like are you tired of doing the dishes um do you need a week's worth of groceries delivered to your doorstep um if you run out of enter ways to entertain the kids these are great things because it also shows they get you you know and of course the, you know would you like a tutorial on doing a, a home haircut um, because that never worked out for any of us so again like you want to be there as a brand there are certain situations that you could be dangerous. And so you got to say, what, what's, what's my role, Brad? What, what do I stand for? How can I credibly be there and not seem like I'm taking advantage of it? Um, keeping a program fresh. So, so many places out there, like 
you want to run a two, three month program and they'll throw out one question. And you know, a lot of people participate at the beginning and then it dies out because I, I gave you my best, you know? <laughs> and uh, you know, you, you people you know, trickle in at the end, but it, it just dies and it sits there. It's painful to watch. Um, so this is something that the Elmers did, uh, the Ooey Gooey Challenge. So I'm sure uh, everyone enjoyed the slime phase if you had kids. Um, I was certainly enjoyed it. They doubled their sounds in blue and they wanted this to continue. And so they had the ooey gooey, uh, ooey, ooey slime challenge. Um, but instead of just saying, show us your best slime creation, which could open the door to a lot of things, they broke it into six different categories, six different phases. So there's a few things that are good about that. One is I'm asking you to come up with six different ways of doing it, which means I'm having you come up with new ways that you can use it. And maybe in some of your ways, other people will like to use it. And I'm also expanding it. So like in, you know, what, at one point I might say, um, what uh, what's your bright? Show me your brightest uh, slime. Show me your most textured, your slimiest, your biggest slime bubble, your craziest color combo, and of course your grossest. Um, by doing that, we're showing the variety, which is what they want to reinforce. Because then you're buying more glue, you make more slime. But they're also expanding it and giving new stimuli, and new reasons for you to come back. Um, very important because again, I, most people have one good idea, you know, and so once you have it. You can ask me all you want, but I gave you my best. Um, and then lastly, like uh, uh, this part, um, you know, you showed, or I showed, like, you know, some really cool ones out there, like definitely probably on the most on the more expensive side. Um, but this one I want to show because it shows a few things. One, that simple can be amazing. Um, and the importance of the creative concept that wraps it. It's not yet. Yeah, technology is cool. TikTok is cool. Snapchat is cool. Um, but technology is what makes your brand different on those platforms. And it gives new reasons for them to continue to use those cool tools out there. So this is something that uh, that Coors Light did. Um, and they, you know, early days of the pandemic where people are sitting there and we discovered the joy of, you know, backgrounds that we can do. And our backgrounds were things that were fun and aspirational and where I'd rather be. And Coors Light said, hey, here's a kind of submit your background for a chance to win it. Um, and it just shows that they get their consumer that it's very much on brand of who they are. It's fun, it's an escape and it's different, but it's just submitting a picture of what you've been staring at all the time. So again, creative concept plus technology equals wow, simple is sometimes the best. All right, so checking time, I'll, I'll start to accelerate um, and hopefully not live, but I just said that. So um, we just you know, reviewed a number of different uh, ways already that brands were using it, uh, using UGC to achieve some marketing objectives while we we're showing best practices. I just wanted to maybe do some quick hits on a few other examples just to show other ways that brands can deliver marketing objectives, but also show other kind of fun programs um, that I, I always like to take out of the bag for, for show and tell. Um, and then from there, quick final thought, Q&A and we're home. So um, Sephora um, in Canada, um, got to show a TikTok one. Um, really simple. It's the holiday season. Everyone's competing for your time and attention. Um, what we ask people to do, or not we, this is, this is why I had to get it. We don't do this. Um, but uh, what the program asked people to do in this situation was um, basically create a TikTok video where, you know, here's a... Um, like it was kind of like a voiceover where I'm showing my favorite one, my second favorite. I want to give this for someone else. You know, typical TikTok style, and I'm showing you the different things. Um, but what you know, for the chance to win like a $500 gift card shopping spree, which essentially pays for your wish list. But in doing this, in order to create it, I have to look at Sephora and say these are the things I want that I'm interested in. By the way, I'm also telling all my friends in that video that these are the really cool things that I think are cool. You might like it there as well. Um, and so with a little bit of sound um, and a little, you know, a few uh, editing tools that TikTok is great at, I can create some nice bite-sized content that I'll share with a social, with a hashtag um, that will also be featured in the gallery that goes forever. Um, and what's amazing is all it took was $500, you know, not for everyone, $500. Um, and as I read, it generated something like 600 million views in Canada, which is like worth 10 times that in the US. So very amazing, very simple, but 
it was creative and it worked. Um, yeah, if you love Cameo, I love Cameo. And so um, Subway uh, tapped into Cameo, um, which is basically, if you're not familiar, it's a platform of anywhere from fringe celebrities that you pay 10 or 20 bucks to leave you a cool message to expensive ones. But basically, I, you pay money and they'll kind of give your kid a birthday message or say something to you. Um, so, it, you know, what they did is uh, Subway wanted to promote, you know, restaurants have limited time on the menu items. They have one month to sell it. Roast beef is iconic. Um, so they took all these great, you know, comedians um, like Cedric the Entertainment, Louis Gausman, um, Impractical Jokers, uh, a couple of people from there, and said to people, um, you know, tell us if you got to get publicly roasted by these people. And it was just a great, playful way to play on words of roast beef. People are talking, people, you know, and they're associating and realizing the roast beef is back. You know, at Subway, you have people talking before. And then afterwards, you get the payout um, of a few videos with about roasting. So it's a nice kind of echo effect to it. Um, Subway also recognizes that they can use this not just for consumers, but for their employees too. Um, it's a great way to inject like fun into the workplace. It's a great way to turn something that's educational into something that's, that's fun. And so, you know, in this program um, called Show Us How You Rap, um, it was designed to basically help educate, increase the knowledge of the sandwich artists at Subway um, around how to wrap and then, you know, help them show off their great work, promote it. Um, and, you know, and basically adding a fun extra challenge of you're going to show it and you're also going to perform a rap about the new line of rap. Um, and so simple, fun campaign to en engage your employees. Um, make education a little fun. Um, by the way, I've read many, uh, you know, Subway has lots and lots of people who work there. Most organizations that are large, their collective influence on their employees in social media far outweighs the brands. So if you have a good relationship with your employees, your employees like your company, they can be great brand advocates. Don't overlook them. Um, and so Subway rewarded I think the first uh, top 15 uh, rappers, uh, like 15 grand or something, or five grand. Um, last one, if you were to Google one thing afterwards, look at this one because it's just so beautiful and amazing. We've been able to be uh, one, one of the partners in a number of different programs um, with, with um, Ally Bank from Thanksgiving to this virtual but not like many, they just, they just do really cool stuff. Um, and this is just a great, um, program that they put together. Um, it was called Daring to Disrupt. Um, and it was designed to recognize women entrepreneurs whose ideas are disrupting, their, are, dis are disrupting their industries, challenging the status quo and empowering. Um, and basically, it will also empower the female entrepreneurs. They're invited for China to sign up for $30,000. And you know, the program is basically for that $30,000 to help kind of continue for them to disrupt uh, their industry. Um, and there were lots of folks like Katie Couric, there was like a number of different magazines. Like, and this is like, like also a good example of an expensive one, there's less expensive ways to do it, but where you generate this content and then how can I maximize it on the other end? Um, whether it's in a gallery, whether it's, you know, tied to different other outlets there too. Um, but it just, it's a beautiful program. So check it out. Um, and in general, check out what Ally did, or uh, it's just, it's Valley Financial, sorry. Um, it's, it's really good stuff. Um, so final takeaway um, that I want you to think about is like, when we think of so, so many people, whether it's sometimes clients or people I talk to, they think user-generated content is just about stimulating advocacy. And, and yes, it, it is, but advocacy can do many different things. It can be surgically used. It's not just about advocacy. It's why are we getting people to advocate? What are we trying to get them to do and say? Um, that's really important too when we're working with clients because what the purpose of advocacy is and who they want to be advocates determines you know, what type of UGC program, what type of platform do you use, what's the creative wrapping around it. And so again, these are the programs that we showed or that I showed throughout. You know, they're all UGC programs. They, all have some gamified incentive to it. Um, they are all different types of advocacy programs, but they all deliver on different types of marketing objectives. And so 
when I look at this, what I love is they all look so different. There's so many different brands that come from so many different things. And, and that's where it's just tying that creativity to the technology so that it resonates with consumers. They're engaged. They have something to say about your brand. You're incredibly directing it in the right direction to accomplish a goal. It's a win-win. It's a fun experience for everyone else. Um, so I think that's it for my presentation. Um, surprisingly on time, which is rare for me. That was um, perfect timing, Matt. Thank excellent. You. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. And Taylor, I think, has collected some questions. Excellent. Yes, so should I stop sharing do. screen for now? That's up to you. You can even keep those up. You know, people want to be inspired by those ideas right. and keep That'll it up a little longer. The people looking at me, so we'll go that route. All right. So one question we have, um, since we have some organizations here that are more B two B, you showed us a lot of kind of B two C examples. You know, how can those B two B brands and clients uh, engage when you don't have really a physical product? So. Are you talking about like so? Some B two Bs, you know, have products. Obviously, they're selling to another right. business. Um, other ones are selling a service. Right. Um, so it's really, I guess, the easiest way is first step back and say, what would I like my customer, my potential customer, to know um, about me, yes. um, and who who would be good for them? You know, how can I reach them? What you know. How can I convince them? It's certainly, you know, more targeted, um, and, but when B2B, the, the payout's that much bigger. Um, it's, the reason I might be going a little high level in dance is that it's, it, it's so much to know the specific company and, and the service or what have you, but, um, you know, even, even if you just generate a handful of reviews or, um, or more positive content on your website, you know, B2B people look at reviews as well. So what I would say is, even if you don't generate a lot, um, you, you generate some and you're tipping the balance more favorably. Um, the other thing to do sometimes is ask yourself, oftentimes, like some businesses are B2B to C, so who are they selling to? Um, how can I get those people excited to create some pull? Um, so there are ways to do it. Um, but I think it just comes down to like, what are you trying to do? What do you want to say? Are there people to do it? Um, I'm not saying it, it can work for everyone, but usually there's, there is an opportunity. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Uh, I think in this particular case, it was an education program. And like you said, it really was a B2B to C. So considering the consumer and how that helps ultimately the consumer can form how this uh, user-generated content could work. Yeah, so it's, you know, an educational one, whether, especially if it's an online one, um, how can I reach out to the people who have uh, already done the program? Because there's, there's, especially online education, there's so much competition, there are no walls to it. Okay. So how can I create greater credibility to my program? Um, how can I get the person who just had a really good experience to promote that experience because you know there's the theory birds of a feather flock together. So if I can get that person or those who have positive experience to say something a little bit more, um, then there's a good chance that there's someone in their circle who might be interested as well. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Another question that came in was, are many small prizes more effective at generating shared content than one or two large prizes? Which one would generate more buzz? Um, so a lot of times, I'll answer a few different ways. Um, <laughs> like a lot of times we'll do a mix. We'll do one bigger prize to get that aspirational element in. Um, and then we'll do smaller ones to create like some sense of attainability. Um, also, smaller ones, like the bigger prize, you, if you're doing a two, three month program, you got to hold on to that one till the end, right? Mm -hmm. um, but smaller prizes I can give out along the way. Um, and therefore, I'm showing the programs paying out, people are getting stuff, they're talking about it, it seems legit, you know. So, you know, there's that balance. But 
sometimes like it doesn't always have to be big like sometimes the it's really about what's the right prize what's gonna resonate what's gonna be interesting mm -hmm. um to people we we did a program a few years ago where we asked people what it was for Cracker Jack and ask them what prize inside do you want? As long as it fits in that box, we'll give it to you. Um, and we even put like a, not a high dollar amount because we want people saying diamond rings, but it was that like that fun of getting to pick my own prize in Cracker Jack, mm -hmm. you know, that made it interesting and talk value and that sort of thing. So think about what also, you know, would interest your consumer, but also think about like, to me, prizes also should reinforce what your brand's about. Um, you know, and be consistent with that um, as well. So what you give away says something about you. Um, so um, I, I would take that, but it doesn't, sometimes people waste money by giving away huge amounts of, uh, of prizes. Um, it's really like how you construct your prize pool, not throwing money all over the place. Excellent. And then do companies like regularly search for content generated yeah, that's that's generated by users and, and then how are they using those products? What's and do they make a point to then highlight that content as a part of their marketing campaign or, or is it more that outreach? Like, do you want to ask people to submit or are they actively trying to see what's already just being out there in the world? Yeah. So, I mean, in general, um, whether you're writing, you know, the UGC contest program, social media, brands should always pay attention to what's out there um, because consumers are like, think of them as your brand QA. You know, there might be something out there that you don't know about. And if it's not correct, you, you want to fix it. Um, by the way, I would also say, you know, I used to have a client who panicked anytime one person said something. And I'm like, you can't panic because there's people will say stuff. You know, but when it gets consistency and mass, that's when you should worry. Um, in terms of like, if we're running a program or, you know, like a, a hashtag program, um, there we have the capability like a social uh, aggregator that can basically scrape um, Twitter and Instagram are best because some of the other networks are not quite as open, but it can scrape looking for that hashtag um, and, uh, and, and find those ones. It's also how we select winners. You don't need to reduce friction of registration. Um, other brands have done things where they just do surprise and delight. You know, they're looking for something, they see something, someone who says something nice about their brand, and they just, you know, it's you can call it random, but it's not really random because I want to say, you know, Anna, you said something nice about my brand, um, and I'm doing it to reward you, but also because you're probably going to tell other people that that great brand that you love before just did this great thing. Um, so there's a number of ways, but in general, yes, you should pay attention. Um, it's social media is the world's largest focus group. Um, so you know, pay attention to what's going on. And so I got overly excited to start asking questions, but you might have seen mm -hmm. pop up on your screen a poll. If you don't mind, before we close this session today, you could just take a moment to answer those few questions. There's about six questions on there. You need to complete all six questions before you can press submit. So another question that we have, Matt, is you know, you mentioned keeping content fresh. Is there a general rule of thumb or a general recommendation for how long a contest should last? So I would, you know, I would say a, a month is a good amount of time. It gives people a chance, um, you know, to participate. Um, to, you know, it also depends on how difficult the ask is. I'm asking you to make a unique video. Uh, we did a program for Sony rolling out a new Tony Hawk game and it was show us your greatest moves. That takes more time. Um, but there are other situations where we give a day um, because it's, talk like a pirate day and uh, Long John Silver has wanted to take advantage of that, you know? And so there's that sense of urgency and relevancy, but, you know, typically programs one to three months, but if it's going on the longer, you know, the two, three month then, you want to keep it fresh um, very much so. Um, you want to keep it interesting along the way, otherwise it gets boring. And keep in mind your early adopters are your, typically your biggest lovers of your brand. and they'll participate first and get bored the fastest. So as long as you can keep it interesting and fresh, you can go longer, but make sure depending on what you're asking that they have enough time to deliver because fast content isn't always good content. And perhaps there might be some correlation too between the size of the prize. If it's a small 
prize, perhaps would you think it'd be a shorter time frame versus those larger grand prizes? And yes, asking more of you know creating a, a video, then it would make sense to be on the longer side. Yeah, correct? size of the prize a little bit, but even bigger than that is how big is the brand's audience um, and how engaged are they? You know, do I have, you know, are they on my own media, my social, are they very engaged? That means they'll react fast. If, if mm -hmm. they're not, if I don't have good own media, if I'm not going to invest in paid media, it's going to take a little more time. And, you know, it's something you want to be careful of because it, if you ask something and don't publicize enough and it's hard to do, it can get kind of embarrassing if look at all the three people who did it, you know, um, you might not get the right content. People might notice, wow, only three people did this, this brand, so there might be something wrong with it. So make sure you think it through what you're asking is it achievable, how much time are they going to achieve it, how can I get them to do it, because it's kind of embarrassing when very few people do it. Right. Excellent. Um, and then, you know, the only other question I just have here is, you know, how can ban brands best take advantage of user-generated content promoting their product and brand? So, I mean, first and foremost, make sure that you have the rights and permission to do it. Um, the nice thing about doing it, asking people to do it in the form of a contest is, is when you agree to participate, you agree to let people use it. Um, so just make sure you have those rights. Um, but, you know, definitely like storing things in galleries, putting them on your website, resharing them in your social media pages, um, you know, there's, there's a number of different ways to do it, but it's a very important question because the more you can help amplify it, the more value you'll get out of it as well. So yeah, definitely have a plan of what to do with the great content. Um, sometimes brands don't, and that's okay too, but it's good at least to have the conversation and say, is there a way we can get a little bit more out of it? Excellent. Well, Great. those are all the questions I have. If there are any other questions, please, you know, unmute yourself, ask the question. I know we're about two minutes uh, over time, so we will be right. closing out, but I just want to give anyone else a final chance. And if you have not participated in the poll, please do that. Thank you. And what I'll do again, Matt, thank you so much for being with us. I know for me, this has a bunch of wheels spinning, like what can I do? What can I do next? So this was really terrific information and everybody you will uh, have access to the recording and presentation. So Matt, thank you. I know it's uh, not four o'clock by you. So, uh, <laughs> I really appreciate, we really appreciate you being here. And absolutely, it was, it was fun. And yes. Um, I say this not as a, as a sales pitch or anything, but if, if anyone has a specific question that they're curious about, I think I love talking about this stuff. I love the creativity <laughs> and the riddle of it. Um, so, you know, if, if I can't answer it or can't solve it, I'll be the first to admit it, but uh, it's, it's fun. It's food for thought. So, you know, Thank don't you. be a stranger, feel free to reach out. Great. And I'm sure you'll have people that will reach out. So thank you. And then I just want to, again, real quick, thank our sponsors. They've been with us for a long time. Taylor, once again, thank you for hosting. We always appreciate that. And if anyone needs to contact Taylor and you need me to introduce you, let me know. I will be happy to do that. We thank our board members. It's a great bunch of people. I think Chris agrees it's a great bunch of people. We and, agree more. Yes. And... Uh, you know, I can't say enough about the group that we work with. And then lastly, our next event really is Spectrum, and it is a live event. But before we get to the live event on May 18th, we need your marketing campaign submissions by tax day, by April 15th. And we hope to see you. This is really our first live event in over two years. And it's a great location. It's at Papago Golf Club. It's just a nice, fun evening with the sunset on the golf course and a bunch of really terrific marketers all in one place. So I hope you will join us. Otherwise, thank you, Matt, for being with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Have a great 
rest of your Thursday. It's opening day for baseball. So I know Chris has to go and I'm getting ready for my game and have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.